Segundo Skinner, existem dois tipos de punição. A punição positiva e a punição negativa. Na punição positiva, uma variável aversiva é acrescentada à situação de modo a punir um comportamento. Já na punição negativa, uma variável gratificante é removida da situação, também como forma de punir um comportamento. Vejamos. Imagine a criança que faz birra e não quer se alimentar. Muitos pais acreditam que se punirem esse comportamento, ele será erradicado. Então, recorrem à punição positiva, que é justamente a adição de uma variável aversiva, como um castigo corporal, por exemplo. Recorrendo à mesma situação da criança que não quer se alimentar, às vezes os pais recorrem à punição negativa como forma de tentar erradicar o comportamento infantil. Nesse caso, eles podem desligar a televisão do quarto da criança ou tomar o seu telefone celular como forma de punição. Aqui a punição é negativa porque ela subtrai um estímulo gratificante. Tanto na punição positiva quanto na punição negativa, o objetivo é o mesmo, tentar erradicar o comportamento precedente. Contudo, Skinner, assim como Thorndike, questionam a eficácia da punição, pois seus efeitos são pouco previsíveis. Os efeitos da punição são pouco previsíveis por basicamente três razões. Primeiro, a punição pode até inibir o comportamento inapropriado, mas ela não ensina o comportamento desejado que deveria substituí-lo. Segundo, a punição provoca o condicionamento de sentimentos negativos, ou seja, se uma criança é punida, a punição instigará respostas como o choro, a fuga ou o revide, o que é incompatível com o comportamento positivo que se espera da criança como resultado da punição. Terceiro, a punição provoca a generalização de aversões, quer dizer, a criança pode desenvolver aversão ao comportamento que provocou a punição, mas também ao adulto que o puniu, ao instrumento da punição e a qualquer outro estímulo relacionado àquele contexto. Em última instância, a punição pode provocar ansiedade, sentimento de vergonha e culpa. Skinner é absolutamente contrário à punição, particularmente em contextos educacionais. Para ele, é mais produtivo reforçar a aprendizagem e o bom comportamento do que punir os desvios. Dê uma olhada. It would seem to me, however, that our educational environments are designed very differently, typically. For example, it, you're punished if you don't do well. Right. The school rewards uh, its best rewards for those people who accomplish the most. But almost by definition within it, there can only be a few at the top. And children aren't rewarded on a on a day-to-day -day basis for accomplishing as right. much as they can. Oh, there are all sorts of things wrong with the contingencies which now prevail, and I want to get away from them just as much as, say, the free school people do. But I think they're going the wrong way. They're not going to be able to get away from these. They always fall back on them eventually. No, you're quite right. Uh, it, all the way up through, even through graduate school, the average student studies to avoid the consequences of not studying. It's an avoidance kind of, or an escape kind of thing. Now, how do you find the positive consequences which can take the place of these aversive techniques? That is the whole art of, of managing a classroom, designing instructional materials, and progress is, is being made. The, the ordinary positive reinforcers of, of, of marks, grades, graduation, and so on, prizes, honors, medals, and all of that, the contingencies are terrible. They're, those things are not contingent on the behavior that you really want to set up. But uh, you can redesign them and, and, uh, and make progress. You make the point that not everyone can achieve the highest levels and get the, the kudos, the medals, and prizes, which uh, depend upon that. But if you redesign a, a course of instruction, as, for example, uh, the, the system that Fred Keller has designed for reorganizing a college course, then you can take progress through the course as your only examination. There's no final examination. You, you can't get through the course unless you know it, because of the way it's designed. And in your system, 
this person would be rewarded by a success and, a, and acquire in the process a desire to learn more on his own. Well, I don't know about the desire to learn more. What he has discovered is that he can improve. He can acquire a behavior which makes him more effective. And that acquisition is, is itself reinforcing. And he's then likely to go on, if the opportunity presents itself with the same kind of instruction, he'll go on and do more of it and acquire, acquire more. And uh, if you don't watch out, he'll, he'll try to stay too long in your school. And, uh, and you'll have to graduate him forcibly. What do you mean that our schools are really using methods of aversive control? I know schools in this, in this country where if you don't bring your homework in, you hold out your hand and get slapped with the ruler. Now, that can be reversed. Uh, it's such a simple thing to do. What are the consequences of using the kinds of adversive reinforcers that schools currently do? What are the byproducts of this Well, kind that's, of that's the trouble. Control. You can, you can, of course, fortunately for us all, I suppose, because the human race would hardly be where it is now if schools hadn't been severely punitive in the past. You know, the, the birch right up on the wall up there, and you do this or else. And, of course, people do learn under those contingencies, but they also tend to play truant, to escape from this when they can, or to drop out as soon as they're able to legally, or to forget it all as fast as they possibly can, or to vandalize, to attack teachers, to break windows in schools, or just to fall into a state of apathy and do nothing. These are all byproducts of aversive control. And although they may have learned something, they're not going to... Uh, have very much interest in supporting education in the future.